Hi everybody, thanks for coming to my talk, a finite element formulation of Baraf Witkin cloth. So I'm going to talk a whole lot about Baraf Witkin cloth today. Um, this is one of the most blockbuster cited papers in all of computer graphics. So it's got over 2200 sites on Google Scholar as I write this presentation. And there's a whole lot of reasons for this because there's actually a lot in this paper. So I think the number one reason that this paper is cited so much is that it is that magic moment in computer graphics history where using implicit integration and preconditioned conjugate gradients hit a performance sweet spot. And this was the paper that observed that this sweet spot was happening. And that's why it gets so many sites. So there's a lot of other stuff in it too. So like constraint-based material formulations. Um, and this was the direct inspiration for stuff like position-based dynamics, which then makes it the grandfather for projective dynamics. And I think this is pretty fair to say, because if you look at the original position-based dynamics paper, uh, Matthias Mueller, he does call it out as the inspiration for it. So it's pretty safe to say that. Now, there's another reason that uh, this paper is so popular, and that's because at this point, um, it's the cloth simulator for a bunch of the movies that we all grew up with. Uh, so for example, Monsters, Inc., all the way back in uh, like 2001, it was a simulator for that, um, all the way up through Soul, which uh, hopefully will come out later this year, and all the Pixar movies in between. This is the simulator that was used for all the cloth there. And it was actually used in a bunch of Disney movies as well. So they forked the code at some point and they have their own uh, high performance implementation. So stuff like Moana, this is actually the cloth simulator used in, in uh, that film as well. All right, so even though it's been around for uh, quite a while, there are still a few questions surrounding it. So first of all, uh, which numerical model is it? Is it a finite element model? Is it mass spring? Is it position-based? It, it can't be position-based, right? It inspired position-based. Position um, so is it FEM? Is it mass spring? Um, so there's a bunch of papers that actually claim that it is mass spring, uh, including uh, one at SIGGRAPH this year, and I'll leave you to find out which one that is. And it turns out that that is wrong. It is not a mass spring model. It is quite firmly an FEM model. Um, so it's, it's actually a little bit of a relief that this is the case, um, which I'll be able to show, because it sure looks like an FEM model. Um, but there's a few pieces that are missing. So for example, uh, shape function derivatives, they don't, don't actually make an appearance and neither do strain energies. Um, it's actually uh, quite a one of a kind model that Verifin we can um, present. But if you fill in a few of the gaps, uh, you can show that yes, it is indeed 100% FEM model. Okay, second, a really important unknown. Is it positive definite? So if you've ever used conjugate gradients, you know that if your energy isn't at least semi-positive definite, uh, the solver can explode. So uh, the paper does act like the model is SPD, semi-positive definite, but it never actually comes out and says it directly. And it certainly never provides proof that the model is SPD. Um, and even back in 2002, um, Choi and Co reported that, uh, actually it does seem like this energy can go indefinite. This is only four years after the original paper. Um, so after that, in this paper, at least, Choi and Co, they, they forge ahead with a mass spring model. So they observe that Verabut can, can go indefinite, but they don't take it any further than that. Um, and if you're a poor grad student sort of starting out, um, you can actually step on this landmine. So you'd never know that this model maybe is not always positive definite. So I found this posting on the bullet forums where some poor student is starting out and saying, hey, this matrix doesn't seem to be positive definite. What is going on? Um, and then you can see Dirk Gregorius, who's a big shot at Valve, he weighs in and he says, yeah, it doesn't really seem like it's, it's positive definite. What is going on? And it's not really clear what the deal is. All right, so I'm going to have a spoiler here. Is the energy semi-positive definite? The answer is no. It is actually not semi-positive definite. In fact, it has a bunch of terms that go indefinite all the time. And in fact, it has a few terms that are always indefinite. So the only reason that the Barrett Whitkin model works is because other terms actually, they regularize this stuff away. So having, having established that, which I will later on, um, I'll, I'll then show you a projection method that can always cut off the indefinite part. And you can see here that uh, it's actually not that much code. It's actually pretty easy to do once you have everything lined up. Okay, so that was an overview of what we're gonna look at. Um, let's look at, at these two questions in more detail. All right, so first of all, is it an FEM energy or what? So we're specifically going to look at the uh, in-plane stretching and shearing uh, components of the barrack witkin energy. Uh, and for these, people have tried to formulate this in terms of FEM using different models. So for example, people have come up with STBK models for stretching and shearing and co-rotational models and other stuff like linear orthotropic models. 
All right, so this is if you uh, just go all in with FEM right from the beginning. Now, all these models are written in terms of F, the deformation gradient, and this is a three by two matrix. So uh, can we write the barrett witkin model in terms of this? And if you try to, you do run into a roadblock right at the beginning. And that is that uh, the barrett witkin model is actually written in terms of particle positions, not in terms of deformation gradients. And that is in R3. It is not a three by two matrix. So it's a different coordinate system right out of the gate. Now, if we look a little bit closer at their formulation though, we see that they create these two vectors, WU and WV. And if you've done this FEM type stuff before, um, it becomes pretty clear, yeah, this is actually the two columns of the deformation gradient. So one minor problem solved there, right? So we didn't know how to formulate this stuff in terms of F, um, but F was just sort of hiding behind a bush here, right? And we found it. Right? So F was, uh, is in the paper if you look closely enough. They just don't call it that explicitly. All right, so F is in the paper. Let's isolate it up here, just so we remember what it looks like. And then let's move on to the next step. So then they formulate some energies. And here stuff gets a little bit weird. So they have stretching and shearing energies. And these are written down in terms of uh, the columns of F. And then they're subtracted from one. So the Bs here actually, uh, they default to one. And we see the same thing happen in the shearing. So uh, this is a column wise operation. So it takes the two columns of F, it takes a dot product between them and it squares it, right? And that's your energy. Now, if we actually wanna write this down as an FEM type energy, uh, usually you use uh, the Cauchy green invariants. So those are the three things that you see on the bottom here. And unfortunately these invariants, they usually just smash everything in F together into one big measure. Okay, so for example, this top one here, um, it just takes the Frobenius norm of F. So that is the squared sum of every entry in F. Uh, so you don't get to isolate a column. It just smashes together all of the entries in F. So we came up with a more general set of invariants um, in a paper last year, um, but this actually, it doesn't help either. So uh, we're still in, we still have the same trouble. Uh, these still just smash together all the entries of F. There's no notion of column wise separation. Okay, so it actually is known that all isotropic models can be written in terms of these invariants, and none of them allow for the column-wise separations that, is, that are needed by the Barrett-Witkin energy. Uh, so therefore, it is fair to say that uh, no isotropic formulation of Barrett-Witkin energy is possible. So we seem pretty stuck, right? Uh, we thought that this would give us an FEM energy, but it doesn't seem to. So fortunately, anisotropy can come to the rescue. So what we just looked at were the isotropic invariants, which is where people usually start. We can look at the anisotropic versions though. So in this case, material, uh, it resists stretching in certain directions as opposed to the isotropic case where it resists stretching uh, the same in all directions. So if we look at cloth, uh, especially uh, yarn-based cloth, so for, for example, in Serio et al, uh, 2014, um, you can see that a cloth is anisotropic. It has warp and, warp and weft directions, and it does seem to be stiffer in those directions. So that's a yarn-based model, but we're looking at a continuum-based one. So there's anisotropic invariants for uh, continuum-based models, and uh, here's two of them from our paper last year, which we extensively analyzed. So let's look at this one in particular. It can be a little obtuse just to look at it um, in this form. So let's look at it even simpler. Let's just look at half of it All right, right here. So F is just the deformation gradient from before. And A is actually a two vector. So this is a 2D and isotropy vector. It is the direction that you want stuff to be stiffer in. All right, so you can set this to whatever you want. And in this case, let's just set it to the X axis like this. And when you do that, uh, the multiply that we see up top, it actually becomes a column extraction operation. So we get WU back. This is exactly the column extraction operation that was missing from the anisotropic or from the isotropic invariants. Now, if we look at the Barrett-Witkin energy, um, it is the two norm of that column, and we can get this now. So if you uh, reassemble the entire invariant again, this corresponds to the squared uh, Frobenius norm. So that is actually the squared two norm. And then we can just write down uh, the, the stretching energy uh, as a square root of this. So that, uh, the energy on the bottom is equivalent to this energy. See, we just took the square root. All right, so we've got it actually. This is the FEM version of the Barrett-Witkin uh, stretching energy. So it's an anisotropic strain energy 
but it's definitely an FEM energy. So just to give you a preview of the final results, uh, here is uh, two simulations. So in blue here, this is the original bear of Woodkin energy, and you can see certain striations form. We're gonna fade to red with the FEM energy. And you can see uh, the FEM simulation is exactly the same. So both qualitatively and quantitatively. So these two simulations match to within working precision. So it checks out. Okay, so question number one is answered. Uh, it is an FEM energy. What about question number two? Is the energy uh, guaranteed to be semi-positive definite? So how do, we, how do we even figure this out? So we've had a sequence of papers uh, over the last three years uh, where we can actually get into really grisly detail to figure out stuff like this. Uh, me and David Eberly, we uh, smushed these papers together into uh, course notes that we presented at SIGGRAPH this year. Um, so there's another treatment of exactly this analysis. Uh, this is all to say that I'm not going to go into detail of this the analysis here because we've documented it in quite a few places. Instead, I'm just going to show you the results of the analysis. So the result of the analysis is this. So the eigenvalues for a single triangle um, undergoing deformation using Bear F. Witkin stretching, uh, the eigenvalues look like this. So the question is, when did this go indefinite? Which is to say, when did these eigenvalues go negative? Uh, so these two can't, right? These are just two, they're two forever. What about these two? Can they ever go negative? Uh, we can manipulate them to figure, to figure this out. And yes, they can go negative uh, and they'll do so under these conditions. And I said before that B actually results, uh, it defaults to one. So it actually is under these conditions um, where these two uh, eigenvalues can go negative. All right, so this is when stretching is less than one. This corresponds to uh, when the, the triangle is undergoing compression. Those are the conditions under which uh, these eigenvalues are not guaranteed to be positive definite. And this actually makes sense. So this is the buckling regime. So when you squish a piece of uniform material, uh, it can squirt out in any direction, right? So it can squirt up, it can squirt down. Uh, both of these solutions are actually energetically equivalent. So uh, this is why the solver diverges. There are uh, multiple equally enticing solutions. It doesn't know which one to pick and thus it explodes, right? And this is physically consistent with the behavior of cloth. So it makes sense it happens in this situation. Okay, this completes our understanding of the stretching term. Uh, what about this one? What about the shearing term? All right, let's give ourselves a little bit of space. Um, we can write this down as an anisotropic energy as well. In order to do that, we have to introduce uh, yet another anisotropic invariant, and it's this one. So uh, basically the work is done at this point. If we just square this, it is actually equivalent to the uh, bear woodkin shearing energy. So we get a little bit of trouble later on though. So what we did before with the stretching term was we just used the analysis from my paper from last year. So can we do this with the shearing term? And unfortunately, the answer is no, because I didn't analyze that invariant in the paper. So uh, I even go as far as to say in the conclusions, uh, basically nobody cares about this invariant, so I'm not even gonna analyze it. And that is the wrong answer past me. Future me cares about this a lot. So we're gonna have to come up with a new analysis method for this one. Now I can't go into too much detail on this and stay inside 20 minutes, so I'll just sketch out what we did. So one of the key assumptions in the previous analysis is that the gradient and the Hessian of the invariant are orthogonal. And this assumption is actually broken with this new invariant. So it blows apart our previous approach, we have to come up with a new one. So we have to pull in a new piece of machinery to deal with this. Um, fortunately, the bunch nielsen sorensen formulas um, from the 1970s, uh, these are uh, perfect for this style of analysis. This is usually a numerical method. It gives you numerical eigenvalues, um, but for the systems that we're looking at, you can actually get analytic uh, results out of it. So I find this is actually a really interesting result, um, and I encourage you to look at Appendix B uh, to see the details on this, because I think it might be applicable elsewhere. Blam. Anyway, after all that, which is not really a walk in the park, we get these expressions for the eigenvalues of the shearing term. And what is this? One of the eigenvalues is always negative. The term is always indefinite. Is this right? Uh, I did extensive verification of this. This is, this is right. So what is going on? Some of the terms are not just sometimes indefinite, they're always indefinite. That's really strange because well, barefoot can, it does work, right? 
Um, it works enough at least that uh, for 22 years, nobody actually had to derive this expression. So what's going on? Well, I have a few possible explanations. Um, these are a, a bit speculative. Uh, so here's the full equations of motion that Barrow Footkin integrates. Um, the mass term here, this is a regularizer. So maybe the mass term regularizes away this indefiniteness. Uh, here's the stretching term. Uh, maybe this stretching term is actually uh, uh, quite a bit bigger than the shearing term. And again, it, it cancels off the uh, indefiniteness. Uh, or maybe it's just the shearing term, it, it never gets that big. So even though it has a negative uh, eigenvalue, that the, the magnitude of that value just never gets that big. So in truth, it's probably a combination of all three of these, which is the reason why um, uh, why Barrett Footkin still works. All right, so we've come to a resolution on the second question. Is it positive definite? Definitely not. So now what? Well, we have explicit expressions for shearing and stretching. And we can just use these to filter uh, the system and guarantee SPD-ness um, at each triangle. And it's pretty easy. Um, so here is the complete code to do it for the stretching energy. And without the comments, it's actually 19 lines of code. So it's not too bad. And here it is for the shearing energy. Uh, this is only 20 lines of code, again, uh, not too bad. Um, and you can actually just grab these from the, the appendix of the paper. So you don't even have to strain your eyes to, to figure out what the heck is going on uh, right here. Okay, so what else can we do with these results? Now, it turns out that the Barrett Witkin energy is actually very close to the ARAP energy from geometry processing. Um, we can even view it as an anisotropic approximation of ARAP. So I have a closed line example here to show you that these two energies do look very similar. All right, so here's what happens when we close line Barrett Witkin. And let's do ARAP, and you'll see that it actually looks quite similar. All right, it's so similar, I'm just gonna show them side by side so you can get a better idea of what's going on here. All right, so ARAP does look a little more rubbery, right? So it has this um, characteristic frequency running down the middle of the piece of cloth that does make it look a little bit more rubbery. But other than that, they look quite similar, don't they? All right, so we can do the same thing with a hang test. So again, here's Barrett Whitkin. And next up, we'll see ARAP. All right, here we go. Again, they look quite similar, right? So look at them side by side, even to see a difference. What we'll see is that uh, Barrett Footkin, it has a little bit more wrinkling in the warp and weft directions. So again, um, it looks a little less rubbery than the ARAP model. Now, if we did something like we put STVK in, um, it actually suppress the wrinkles altogether. Um, so that throws up the, uh, the balance off entirely and you don't get any wrinkles at all. Another question here is uh, th that shearing term, how important is it exactly? Um, it actually is pretty important. So if you omit it uh, and you run the stretch test from before, um, you don't get any wrinkles at all, which is just weird, right? And finally, you can have a little bit of fun with this. So um, we derive stretching and shearing energies for the case where the anisotropy terms are just the principal axes. Um, now that we know that this is, this is the actual formulation, you can just mess with it and try, try it out on other directions. All right, so we tried it out on this direction and you can see you know, weird stuff happens, right? And you can take it to a real extreme. You can make some really weird looking cloth. So uh, what's this good for? Um, well, for example, there was a yarn homogenization paper at SIGGRAPH this year. Um, so it might be that this is uh, an attractive formulation for stuff like that. All right, so in summary, Vera Footkin, definitely a finite element model. Don't look like an amateur by going around and saying it's a mass spring model. Second, it goes positive. It is not positive definite. It goes indefinite all the time. So uh, if you want to guarantee positive definiteness, just go ahead and grab the code from our paper. All right. Thank you again for all your attention and I'll be here all day. <laughs>